Welcome to Something for the Turbo, the new weekly podcast brought to you by Unfound, the global platform for the travel-loving cyclist. Welcome to the show. We've got a superb episode for you today. But before we get cracking, I wanted to ask you all please to subscribe to the podcast if you're enjoying them. And also, please do tell your cycling mates. Spread the word, get everyone listening. We'd really appreciate all the support we can get. Today, I'm joined by Yanto Barker. Yanto is a former professional cyclist, and we go into quite a bit of depth around both of his careers and the sabbatical he had in between. But he's also synonymous with the brand Le Col, because he is the founder and CEO. We talk about that journey from a fledging idea to building the business into what has become one of the most desired brands out there. And we discuss many other things from working in wind tunnels to working with Bahrain McLaren, racing, training, trenching, Strava, bib shorts and how complex they are to make and the labor that goes into it and loads more. Yanto is a superb athlete and entrepreneur and his drive, passion and focus is truly contagious so this one's well worth the listen without further ado let me bring you yanto yanto thank you very much for joining us today how are you getting on uh very good thank you busy uh yes very busy child care and full-time job is uh is definitely taking its toll a little bit but yeah we managed to to get by excellent well thank you very much for taking the time to join us appreciate things that crazy for for everyone at the moment for those that don't know you and i'm sure most people particularly in the uk and and probably further afield do should we start at the beginning be good to find out a little bit more about your background your cycling career the sort of two halves of that and and how you got into it and and then we'll sort of get on to to le col and and the the growing empire that is and and where the the plans for the business are and and go from there yeah sure so i mean my name is janto barker i am an ex-professional cyclist I started cycling competitively at about 13 or 14 um, on mountain bikes. And then by the age of 17, I was on the GB national team and continued to race full time as a career until I was 26, just 2006, that will have been. And at that time, I actually didn't wasn't getting the contract that I felt like I deserved and I and I was hoping for and definitely wasn't getting paid what I needed to be to feel confident that you know I was doing a good job even though I felt like my results justified it so I yeah. put myself out of competition for three years and 2000 well March 2006 was when I did my last race of if you like the first half of my career yeah and then I didn't race again until February 2009 and in the gap, I came up with the idea to start my own business. And actually, 2009, I was building the foundations to a business as well as racing again. And I, I, I'd never really intended to come back to racing in the second half of my career, which I did until um, 2016. So 2009 to 2016, I was back full time as well as running and building a business. Well, in the beginning, it was just building a business. And then later, we didn't start trading officially with La Col until 2011. And I was working seven days a week, long, long days and training, you know, 500 miles a week on the bike. So yeah. actually, that became quite a challenge. I mean, I didn't have kids then. So actually, it was a bit easier than it is now. <laughs> <laughs> but, but still pretty challenging. And that's that's kind of interesting is because it's, your second half of your career was almost more successful than you. I mean, both very successful. But you obviously had this idea during your, your time out. Did you feel that having a sort of fixed goal of what you wanted to create with Le Col and then coming back into cycling did that make make it more enjoyable being a professional cyclist again yeah definitely the yeah. biggest difference between the first half and the second half of my career and they're basically 10 years each uh, sorry not quite seven seven eight years 10 years before that was all the pressure I'd taken off myself for the second phase and it was no longer about trying to fulfill potential which I felt a great burden of in my yeah. early 20s and it was actually just about being the rider I was as good as I was and enjoying and making the most of it because in the first half of my career I was constantly chasing a dream and an idea that I actually felt a lot of pressure from I put on myself no one no one put the pressure on me I I put it on myself but it definitely was something that inhibited my enjoyment a lot but I didn't know that until I came back in the second phase of my career and and I didn't have it interesting so it gave you a little bit more more of a purpose I suppose as well yeah and do you do you feel I mean I've spoken to a few ex-pros I mean it's it's a tough life do you, you you're obviously still riding now a lot of people I speak to when they've retired they say oh I finally found enjoyment in riding my bike again where are you with your cycling love at the moment well I think I was lucky in that I enjoyed the second half of my career so I enjoy it now but I enjoyed yeah. while I was racing like I used to make a, a joke to my young teammates 
when they're in their early 20s and I was mid 30s. And I'd say, because I because I did have a job by then as well, you know, 33, 34, 35, the business was actually starting to move and, and go somewhere. And when I would work on it in the afternoons, it's a very dry job compared to being a sportsman, a professional sportsman. You know, you get a lot of adulation as a sportsman, you get a lot of attention, you get a lot of excitement. You know, you're traveling around the world, you're going to races where there are journalists and people asking for autographs. I mean, that's all quite flattering. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if you're running a really successful business, there's there's no one asking for your autograph apart from to pay for stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly, so, inside the check. Yeah, so I used to make the joke to my young teammates that, this is just a cycling holiday. I mean, except that it's better, that it, it's paid for and you even get prize money and then you get to hang out with a load of other cool people, cool people like, yeah. like you do. Like, it, it's not real work. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. But I suppose, obviously, would you? You're obviously a very. I think the sort of focus and drive and discipline of professional cycling probably helped you in the early years of building the business. Am I, oh, I, set the track? I mean, yeah. I am. I am a disciplined person. So once I've set my mind to something, then you know, I kind of joke with my wife that when I first met her, I, I, she wasn't my wife then, but I, I explained that this is my job and nothing gets in the way of it. No, no lunches, no shopping, no friends, no family. Work for everything else second i mean it probably wasn't quite like that but you know that was the way i i viewed it anyway in my own head that's how it was and yeah. that's a luxury but also you know as a professional athlete it's kind of your job to move the rest of your life out the way of your of that profession yeah a lot of young athletes don't do that well enough so they're constantly encountering obstructions and barriers and delays and distractions to their fitness and to their you know training process where actually they should be moving people and things out the way of it so as they don't need to think about their training it's just happening naturally and that's all they've got to do but that's slightly separate <laughs> so, creating the environment for success right yeah, and that, that's exactly. totally it which is which was what makes your return to cycling and managing a, setting up a business completely staggering really well what you mentioned you had the, obviously the hi hiatus and that you had this idea of creating something that you've obviously gone on to achieve what sort of ignited ignited the cinders what what started you thinking that there's an opportunity there because it was an interesting time given where cycling's went in the first few years and then has gone since what was it what was your tell us your vision i suppose okay i mean it's it's a complicated one because there are a lot of strands that have led me to it but actually the main one bizarrely has got nothing to do with you know popularity of cycling I, I, the two big drivers to directing me down the channel that we've gone and I've gone now um with this business were I didn't want a boss yeah okay <laughs> and I like I can't overstate how much of a you know motivation that was I mean I, I have I've, ha I've had bosses and I'm a good team player so I don't have an issue with you know collaborating and um compromising and all those kind of things but I rarely had a boss that I really respected and would want to work for and I felt like I'd rather just be my own boss so that was a huge huge driver interesting in starting a business rather than going to a job and the yep. same thing, and the main reason I picked the cycling industry, because I did look at a couple of different options within the industry, not just apparel, was that's all I knew. I, I'd left school at 16. I have no qualifications. I have uh, no education. You know, I have three GCSEs, which for anyone outside of the UK is like your most basic qualification. And normally all kids leave school with at least nine or 10. And I had three. Yeah. So, you know, in terms wow. of qualification i i just didn't i wasn't in, it's not that i'm not bright i just wasn't interested in education no exactly yeah exactly you don't you don't get to what you've done um if, if you're not bright but you know despite the fact that sort of formal education didn't ignite your your interest particularly did, did you always feel that there was an entrepreneur within you did you always were you do you think you're a disruptive thinker you're creative was that always at the back of your mind no, yes, I am. But no, I didn't realise until much older, like almost in my probably not until I just reached 30. I'm definitely an entrepreneur. I know I can, you know, I'm quite an analytical person. And I, I've kind of profiled myself, I've done plenty of the psychological tests and things. But also, I've met lots of entrepreneurs. And yeah. we really resonate together. You know, we did a crowd cube raise. And through that process, I met lots of um, like minded people. But the reason I didn't think I was like that earlier in my life is because I come from a very alternative family who uh, in the mainstay are just not capitalist or not driven to, you know, financial and commercial success. My mum, yeah. you know, she's a lovely person, but she's kind of the most gentle person you could imagine. She's just not a, dr a driven person to success. She didn't put pressure on me. She didn't make any sort of requirements when I said I'm leaving school with three G GCSEs and I'm not going to go to college. 
you know, she said, mm, are you sure? And I said, yes. And she said, okay, then. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Okay, there you go. Yeah. So, so yes. Yeah, so, and so I was kind of a little bit of a black sheep in my childhood in that I, I'd never met anyone else like me until I moved to London and started hanging out with a few more business people. Then I started to go, oh, I'm a bit more like you. I almost felt like a bit of an ugly duckling in that way. And it wasn't until I was 30 that I started to connect and that validated who I was inside. And then it grew and it grew. And, you know, by that time, I already had a business idea and I was already moving. So it's kind of fortunate really, that I was like that because the success of the business in its early years was absolutely fundamentally required that type of attitude and characteristic. Yeah, I find that fascinating. And I think that for any young people listening, you know, despite what clear success you had within your career in your early 20s I feel very much the same as well I think 30s is kind of a, a eureka moment where you finally figure out who you are in the world and what what, what your strengths are and, and ultimately what your weaknesses are as well and things come a lot clearer as you get a little bit older I think definitely I mean in in my 30s when I when I had my 30th birthday I remember waking up and thinking oh my god my whole 20s has just disappeared and I don't feel like I've got anything to show for it I better do a job in my 30s otherwise I'm going to get to 40 and which I am now by the way and feel like I've you know I've just wasted another decade <laughs> okay well, you definitely you definitely haven't done that so just just in terms of sort of filling in I actually sort of missed the the initial rise of, of Le Col in the UK I, I left the UK in 2010 and moved moved to Asia obviously a keen cyclist has sort of saw the the growth of it from afar and I've also I had a little bit of insight into parallel business, which I'd, I'd be keen to get some sort of thoughts and, and mention in a minute. But talk me through the early years and how the business grew momentum domestically here in the UK, because it really got a strong presence here, here in the UK. And then it's sort of slowly grown more internationally, correct? Yeah, I mean, it's been really slow, I would say. I mean, it's I've been basically working on the business for just about 10 years now, as in, you know, since concept. And the first seven <laughs> were really, really, really slow. Because even though as a company we had, you know, decent turnover in 2017, 18, it wasn't a lot local. It was still, you know, part of the businesses in Italy and part of the businesses servicing other brands, so not the local brand. And it wasn't really until 2000 and end of 2018, beginning of 2019, that that's really started to change. And then obviously okay. in those years, it was really mainly in the UK. It wasn't internationally at all. I would say internationally, we're still only just scraping the surface of, you know, what's truly possible and, you know, what we're really just getting going. Right. And I think, you know, I think for a lot of people listening, they might not really realize how the how the industry works. I think that a lot of brands that people are familiar with don't realize that a lot of these firms are OME brands, so they don't actually make the products themselves. So they'll go to a third party factory that may be making kit for many different factories. And Yanta, obviously your factory makes kit for other brands as well, by the sounds of what you just said there. And I think that for me, sort of doing a bit of research prior to this call, that's something that I think is is so fascinating that you had the foresight or the drive to want to own that manufacturing piece because it gives it gives you so much autonomy obviously it gives you a, a lot of stress and other complications as well but so you've seen a lot of these brands sort of pop up and it's, it's all the design and marketing uh, but if you don't own that that whole life cycle it's very hard to create differentiating elements to your garments and that's that's the key have i messed that up or would you say uh, i'm on the right line i'd say that's exactly right and i think so what we've done, and I think a large part of this idea was just pure uh, intuition. I, I wouldn't be able to claim that it was all very, you know, um, consciously purposeful from the beginning, but happens to have been a, a good idea is the old fashioned brands like Nalini, Santini, uh, Moa, you know, those kind of brands, they, they do own their own factory and they are manufacturing their own goods. Those those are factory brands and they are the sort of mainstay of even Castelli of cycling apparel from the beginning of, you know, time kind of thing. They've probably 40, 50 years. What they don't have is the front end, which is the the, the way that Rafa have built their brand and exactly, um, yes. have a really strong brand, beautiful messaging, great yeah. product, um, but really they present it beautifully and that's, that's key. And they also have a very strong direct consumer channel. So all those brands I named, that they're, they're all Italian as well, but all those brands I named earlier, Castelli, Rafa, sorry, Castelli, Santini, Moa, Nalini, they, they're kind of old fashioned brands which service their customers through distributor and retailers. Yes. Now, yeah. now I was quite clear or what we're trying to achieve is 
I want to own the manufacturing like they do, but I also want to own the front end like Rafa does. And I think we're unique in the respect that we're the only brand of a, of a sort of significant size that has done that properly. And I think it, it does give you headaches, but it gives you the ability to make the headaches go away as well, rather than being beholden to another brand that's servicing you and you just have to deal with their weaknesses. Now we can invest into our weaknesses and we can make the business stronger or we can identify areas that need a bit more resource. And it's a constant, never ending process. And we actually don't do very much third party business now proportionally anymore because in 2018, May 2018, up until that point, and I kind of owned the factory since early 2014. So for four years, the factory as a facility was too big to justify the brand. And it was a constant struggle to feed it and, um, you know, create that justification to having that much resource in Italy. Yeah. Okay. Until May 2018, when in the same month, we went from being too small to too big. And I had instantly had a new headache, which was I needed to recruit people. I needed to find more resource. I needed to be able to manufacture more units than we'd ever produced per month before. And it was it was kind of a bit disappointing because I'd kind of looked forward to being big enough to justify the factory for years and years and years. And yeah. instead of getting a few, you know, a little bit of time to enjoy that that was a good decision and it was the right thing to do, then I was straight into the headache of having to build it to service the demand that we created. God, it's nonstop, isn't it? It's one thing after the other. Yeah. So where, where are you at now with the, the factory size and sort of balance? Yeah, uh, it's a never-ending kind of... Juggling act. Yeah, juggling act. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, fortunately now, the juggling is all in the one direction, which is adding more balls and, you know, delivering more more units. So that's good because we also had a few issues where we, we thought we were going to grow faster a few years ago and then it stopped and we had to cancel a whole load of orders and that was really disruptive. <laughs> yeah. There's a few yeah. feeding issues for, I'm sure there are other brands going through, not necessarily in cycling apparel, but any manufacturing brand who's servicing their own demand, you know, it's really difficult to get the balance right of always having enough product and being able to predict it far enough in advance to be able to deliver it when you need it but also not oversupplying yourself and creating an issue on tying up cash in stock and you know having to discount things because you've got cash flow issues or all that kind of stuff so it, it yeah. really is all consuming and it's now now I've got people to you know analyze analyze that data so it's not all on me but in the early early years it was you know definitely doing all the forecasting and trying to figure it all out and try to predict trends and Absolutely. market and that must have been so stressful uh, it, it, it kind of was and it wasn't you know i'm an analytical person anyway so you know i go to sleep yeah. thinking about numbers uh, i'm not okay. I'm not a words person i'm a numbers person and so really it was a great channel to let that analytical energy loose on and i enjoyed it but i think i'm just a I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. You know, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm not a specialist. So to get someone specialist who knows how to build the spreadsheets that help you predict what's coming and what's going much, much more accurately is much better, much safer for the business, much better for our cash flow and much less dependent on my make it up as I go along attitude. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's that's part of the skill of being a, a leader, a CEO and an entrepreneur, right, is that at some point you've grown the business and then you need to bring in that expertise and then trust them to to do their piece. And that's um, that's not no easy thing to achieve as well. It's funny you say that it isn't, but it's also really logical when you kind of present it in its simple fact based form. So I don't, I actually feel like most successful businesses just do what is obviously the right thing to do and don't get distracted by emotion or politics or other things that, you know, really take your eye off the ball and can be very yeah. productive. So actually it's, it's, it's not being special it's not doing the stupid things. That's what makes successful business, I think. It's being very rational, but I can tell already that's that's how your that's your one of your key skills, and that's hence the idea of looking at the factory and making that acquisition. You know, that's that's a very logical and rational thing to do. But most firms wouldn't have made that leap or haven't made that leap to own you know, create probably, create this new vision. It was probably a, as much about you know having a compulsion to control it as much as it being a good idea, to be honest. But yeah. If I yeah. can't control it, then I'm just beholden to it. And I'd rather be beholden to myself, at least then if I, yeah. if I screw it up, then that's my fault. Yeah, that's fair enough. And obviously, what was supposed to be a super exciting year with regards to the tie up with Team Bahrain McLaren, what's been happening with that? How did that come about? And how's the whole pandemic situation affecting things? Well, obviously, it's really bad for cycle racing is is awful in that it hasn't really happened this year. Yeah, it was. I mean, it's been a dream of mine since 
you know, the concept of the brand to be able to sponsor a world tour team. And in some ways it was a, it was a kind of watershed because the brand then achieved more than I personally had, as in, I never quite reached the world tour as a rider. And I felt really proud and privileged to have been able to build something that could afford and, and could participate at you know world tour level so the fact that they haven't been able to race has been a little bit disappointing and a bit sad but really i haven't dwelled on it because there's you know there's so much more important things to focus on and you know people's health is and and you know the world economy is far more important than you know my personal dream of you know watching my jersey ride in the tour de france kind of thing which we could still happen later this year so fingers crossed that they do they do, they are able to put that on and it and it does go ahead but let's hope so is yeah. it a two year thing that you're is it a two year thing you're doing a one year thing what's, yeah, what's the... deal, yeah so um but that that was always the minimum in terms of our intent and in, you know as to your question about how did it come about we were looking for a world tour team and i was talking to a few people and then uh came in contact with the old cmo of mclaren global who had become md of mclaren cycling and that the bahrain merida team was going to become bahrain mclaren for this year 2020 so this is obviously last year we were having this conversation yeah. um, a chap called john allett who is a really fantastic guy and sold me his vision of the team and i absolutely bought it you know in terms of values and principles he really resonated with my own you know internal view of how things should be done and and what we would be aiming for and so really it was combined with the mclaren brand and what that stands for in terms of innovation formula one performance all that kind of stuff you know it was everything i could have dreamed of in principle of you know uh, a partner we did have a couple of options for teams last year to, to sponsor this year and i think we you know we made the right decision with them and you know they've been a fantastic team even if they haven't been able to compete very much yeah well, i'm sure it's going to be an, an amazing journey when things do return to some sort of semblance of normality let, let's hope and, and where where do you see the brand going in the next few years i think we just spoke offline that um obviously very very well known we're here within the uk and still huge amount of opportunity further afield globally as well what, what what's the plan what's the master plan it's, that's, that's quite a big question. <laughs> yeah, okay, sorry. Um, uh, as the founder of a business that's been through a number of different investment rounds, I've been asked it a lot. I usually, I mean, I'll be quite honest, I, I didn't really know anything about business when I started. So, you know, I, I was genuinely working off intuition, guts, a bit of bravery, and um, a lot of hard work. Yeah. And where we've got to is, it, it's a bizarre thing to say, but it's as much of a surprise as I thought it was inevitable that it would happen like this anyway. So so it's a really weird conflict of emotions. While I feel confident, and I always felt confident we would be successful, I felt yeah. annoyed that I was wrong and that I had to keep watching over my shoulder in case I'd missed something or you know something was going to really screw it up for us. So I say that because going forward, I think I'd like I'd like to fulfill the potential of the business. And I'm very objective about that above my own personal interest. You know, at one point I owned hundred percent of the shares. Now it's much less, I won't say exactly what it is, but it's much less than that. It's 50. And I don't feel any less ownership to the project, any less ownership of and responsibility to delivering a good return, making good product, making happy customers. You know, those, those sort of motivations are really strong. And I think as long as they remain, then I'd like to, stay in the business and stay focused on improving it and i think if i do both those things then we're going to naturally grow and we'll naturally grow internationally and we'll naturally you know develop and expand and and i think that's that's exciting yeah however if i'm not the person to take it all the way i don't know where all the way would be then i'm equally open to admitting my own weaknesses or an ability to do the best job possible and then i would be happy to someone to take my place or whatever i don't mind yeah there's there's that there's that rationality again i like it and uh, i mean as a business grows i suppose it will it becomes more of a sort of lifestyle or is the focus purely on a parallel or do you see it becoming more of a, a lifestyle brand really uh, i think so I, kind of, I would answer that in sort of two ways. We are very focused on performance at the moment. You know, those are our credentials and that's what we want, you know, be known for. Um, naturally, if you do a good job and you've got strong brand credentials, then you can sell more than just performance product and apparel. And we, and we will, and people will want it. You know, people will want hoodies and tracky bottoms and, you know, all sorts of other things that we don't necessarily do that much of at the moment. So while I think that would always... Uh, be included in a future plan i think it's more about the proportion so we want to remain in integrity to the core 
vision of the business that I had and we've been we are still working towards and I've been working towards for like I said just about 10 years now I yeah. don't want that to change as long as I'm in this business so I think that's really important so while we can do lots of other things on the periphery that won't be our core product and that won't be what we're known for no but yeah but it becomes more of a sort of if it grows more internationally it becomes more of a, a sort of community I suppose rather that's what I meant in terms of lifestyle in terms of of course off the bike stuff but it becomes big bigger than just a parallel it becomes connecting people from around the world with a similar appreciation of that performance and quality yeah I think so I mean one of the things that I feel like is a differentiator for us is like I genuinely was a cyclist and I genuinely have grown up in cycling since I was 14 13 or 14 yeah. And benefited from what cycling has given me as an individual. I've seen the world, I've competed, I've met amazing people, I've been educated, you know, I was part of a GB team, which was invested into with sports psychologists, nutritionists, physiologists, you know, coaching, all that stuff, you know, I genuinely benefited from that infrastructure while it was very early at the time I was uh, benefiting from it it is what you see today and what then went on to create all the race winning and medal winning performances from gb athletes at olympics and world championships and stuff so you know i i feel hugely grateful to cycling in that respect and i want that attitude and that experience of mine to come through us as a brand and, and our product and one of my favorite bits of feedback that i get which is pretty much like the number one most important thing for me is when someone says, oh, I met another person wearing Le Col on a training camp or on a, you know, they went to Mallorca or something, I don't know. And they say they were really nice people. Like yeah. that, that to me is the perfect thing. Feedback. Yeah. That's it. It's when you set something up, you, you basically want your personality to resonate through your business. And that's the perfect example of that. <laughs> I'm quite cautious of saying that because, it, you know, it's, it's not about me, but I do have strong values and I am, you know, very intentional about what I'm trying to create. And I think being kind and strong at the same time are two really important characteristics. I don't think you need to be, you know, a shark in business to be successful. I don't think you need to be mean to win. I think you can do it fairly. I think you can do it with integrity. And that absolutely is, you know, what I'm trying to do with this business for sure. Yeah, that's exciting. And obviously, I think the last couple of years, you I don't know, but it's, it's been a tougher couple of years for uh, cycling parallel. For someone like yourself that, that owns the, the this factory and, and the sort of branding end, there must be, you must be gathering momentum and, and, and being able to increase market share. That must be what it's about now, sort of, sort of chipping away at more, you know other brands. And that's the key, right? Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So while the last few years haven't been like more recently, but more recently is a bit artificial with this virus situation, <clears throat> we've been outgrowing the market trends and seasonality. So you know, we would have Octobers, which are not normally big months, bigger than Junes just because yeah. in the time between June and October, we grew as a business. So while it was proportionally less and had it been a June six months later, we would have been that much bigger again. So I haven't really seen that. But then in the last, well, three or four months, we've been growing really strongly, you know, like 100% a year is, is, is quite steep. You know, it's, yeah. it's hard to forecast. When you start, you know, doing budgets and forecasting, you can do about 20% increase accurately after 20, between 20 and 50%, it gets a little bit woolly and you're, you're guessing a little bit above 50% increase a year. You are really guessing a lot. You tend to make a bunch of mistakes and get a few things wrong, but, but at that level of growth, you can afford to, in some ways, as long as you've, you know, you've got a really keen eye on your cash flow. Yeah. So, you know, because mistakes, let's say you overordered, which we've done in the past, you make a mistake and you've got, you know, £100,000 too much stock. As long as you're growing fast, you'll get through it. I manage that, yeah. yeah. And, and if you are if you haven't got enough stock, then you start panicking that you get lots of customer service, you know, queries going, when's this coming back or when's this back in stock? You haven't got my size and all that kind of stuff. And again, you, you sort of panic buy and you sort of put a bit of pressure on the factory to deliver a few things a couple of weeks early and, and then you, you sort of get back on it again. So there's a lot of that going on. Okay. And how, how for people listening that, that are interested or want to ch check your stuff out or and even purchase, how do you sell outside the UK? Can you can you buy online? Do you ship around around the world? What's what's the best way for people to find your stuff? Yeah, we have a pretty good international uh, website which 
is currently in the process of being translated to a few other languages, but anyone in the US and Australia and uh, everywhere will obviously be able to buy through there. We also sell via Wiggle, so products are available there if it's not on our site. But yeah, our own website is the best place to come. (laughs) Lookhold.pc. Cool, we'll pop that all in the show notes so people can check it out. And before I sort of ask you in terms of where you are and what you're doing cycling at the moment, I think one of the things that fascinated me the first time I went into a factory uh, is is the process of making bib shorts is far more labor intensive than I think most cyclists appreciate. Is, is that something that caught your mind? What were the things that caught your mind the first time you walked into a factory? Uh, good question. I'd probably find that hard to answer because I don't know if I had any expectation. <laughs> yeah, okay. You know, I was completely new. I, I One, I was completely inexperienced, so I'd never been into one before. And I did go before I owned it, so I knew what I was buying. What was going on? No, I just meant it because I think sometimes people sort of stop and think, okay, for for bib shorts, that's a very a lot of money to 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 pay. But but when you actually see the process of how it's made and and what goes into it, it kind of makes a little bit more sense, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, and it's very it's very manual. And I think you know exactly we, we own our factory in Italy, not in the Far East. So when I'm always astonished that so many brands. Well, I'm actually always astonished as a consumer that we have an expectation for prices to be so low because actually you get what you pay for and a lot of it is labor. And if you go to the Far East where people are really not paid very well, then it can reflect in the RRP of the product that you're buying. But I don't know if it's healthy. In fact, I don't think it's healthy at all. So I actually feel like our product made in Europe by people that are paid a good wage, a proper wage, is actually very fairly priced. And while it might feel expensive because... You know, it's over £100 for a jersey and, I don't know, over £150 or $180, $90 for a pair of shorts. You know, that's that's what it costs. That's what life costs. Yeah. You know, those people... Exactly. Have- and then you add into things like all the safe, health and safety measures that might not be implemented in other parts of the world and, uh, you know, sort of staff welfare. I, I completely agree. But I think you know, the only reason I bring it up is that I think it's easy to not think about the whole life cycle of a product and when you buy it and just think about the price and think that's a lot. But, you know, that's something that, thing that really struck me when I saw how much labor goes into making something you're like wow kind of it makes a lot more sense now and then you add into the complexities in terms of buying material for mills and how much you need to buy and how much how expensive the material is as well you understand why why these are sort of high high high-end garments cost as much as they do it absolutely makes sense and adds up yeah definitely i mean you know we definitely invest into really quality materials quality chamois in the shorts you know even just the way the stitching is done, reflective panels, all that kind of thing is, it does add up. It's really expensive. So, you know, and also, you know, for a business to run properly, there are a lot of non-revenue generating services that are required, you know, accounts and lots of the... Now you're not doing everything yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it's good. I mean, I think it's fair. And hopefully people who've bought the product or will buy the product will appreciate the the kind of care and attention that's gone in to justify that and provide the value infuse the product with the values that like i've explained earlier hopefully they get that good yeah well definitely we'll put all the links in the show notes and and do check it out there's some absolutely lovely kit top quality but it also looks fantastic as well which is always key so tell me i've i've had a little look on strava you're you're still going pretty well given you've retired and have two young kids (laughs) (laughs) i I am a deeply competitive person <laughs> and I've managed to funnel my competitive characteristics into two simple channels and everywhere else I don't really care okay probably a third but I won't talk about that one uh, and they are cycling still even though I only ride six hours a week and business so okay. um, you know board games at Christmas my wife is much more competitive um, you know kicking the ball around in the garden with the kids you know, they're much more competitive. My daughter is only three and a half and she's already talking about winning on her bike against me. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> that's okay. That's there as well. So yeah, I, and I'm, I, you know, I, I make the joke to my wife that I can still fit into my wedding suit, which is five years ago and uh, in the middle of the season. So yeah, pretty pleased, you know, that I look. That's pretty good going, yeah. Yeah. Still eating lean. Any more crazy plans to do any? I, I saw your trenching video. Talk us through how the idea of that came about. Yeah, my failed trenching video. For anyone that yeah. knows what this is, which probably no one will, because I made it up. Um, there's a there's a place in the sea called the Mariana Trench, which is deeper than Everest is high by about another third. So, in keeping with the kind of charitable element of um, sustainability and clearing up plastic from the oceans, I thought that would be a good idea. 
I underestimated the steepness of the climb that I'd chosen. I'd, I'd never been to that climb before I picked it. I picked it on Strava or I picked it on Google, checking oh, did you? Uh, gradients and corners and elevation. And then when I got there, I didn't have the right gears for it. So that was a bit of an issue. And then after 12 hours of riding, I think 11 hours 45, I'd, I'd completed the Everesting elevation game, which I'm sure most yeah. people know of. And then when I sort of came to terms with the prospect of doing another third, for another four or five hours, I just thought, no, nah, I, I can call it a day there. Everything's known about, you know, I've done that now, that'll do. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll park trenching for another day. Yeah. Absolutely hilarious. Um, and obviously, you're very fortunate to travel travel a lot in your racing career. Where, where are your favourite places to, to go and ride the bike outside the UK? That's another good question. I mean, riding for me is more about the dynamics of speed with the bike, the feeling at one, you know, with momentum and the flow of wind through your hair and stuff and also who I'm riding with so actually I'm yeah. lucky I would say I don't need to go anywhere to enjoy cycling as much as I could possibly enjoy it like I did a ride this morning with three of my mates and you know I live in Twickenham in London yeah. we did an, an hour and a half out and back so you know a little bit of built up area a little bit of countryside and back again that was pretty quick I saw yeah. that this morning right past my house actually oh really yeah yeah Walton or was it is it Walton? Yeah, yeah Walton, yeah. yeah. Walton, yeah, yeah. Well, so I, I, yeah. Using that as an example, I enjoy that as much as I would going to the Alps or the Pyrenees. Yeah, there's different things to enjoy uh, when you go to places like that. And I'm really lucky I've been to pretty much all of them in mainland Europe and, and America and Australia and places like that. But yeah, it's more about the people and, and the feeling of being fit. So as long as I've got that, then I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm definitely a, a, like a the better I feel, the more I want to train. So if I lose fitness, then I find it really, really difficult to get back again. So I tend to just yeah. maintain a really healthy standard. Well, cause did it, am I right in saying when you retired for the first time, you didn't touch the bike for 18 months? Yeah, that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but you you're obviously got the genes. I spoke to uh, Ryan Sears on the podcast, who's a, who's a pro in the US, and he... He's great friends with um, Dave Zabriskie as well. And he said literally just two hard training days and he'd be on a couple of hard, couple of hard training weeks and he'd get back pretty quick. Was it was it a struggle to get back or, or yeah, it, it took was, a while? Uh, it's an interesting one. And actually, I approached it as a bit of a project because, like I said, I'm analytical. So I was kind of analyzing the psychological uh, strain that I was going through trying to get back from 18 months off and then get back to race fitness. And yeah. I knew, so what's, what's kind of funny, and if you talk to people who are very inexperienced, they look at either pros or ex-pros like me who've done 20 plus, 24, 25 years of, I don't know, 15 to 20,000 miles a year. So getting on for 25, 28, 25, 28,000 kilometers a year. Yeah. yeah. And they think, oh, it's easy for you because you're good. But if you break it down, the experience of trying hard, whether you're doing 15 kilometers an hour or 45 kilometers an hour, the, the physical sensations are identical. You're just traveling at different speed. So basically, I, I sort of broke my return to training down into the simplest form in that I was used to suffering on the bike, at, you know, 35, 40 kilometers an hour in training and racing. And in the first two months, of my comeback to racing and you know starting to train for it again i accepted that i would probably be about 10 kilometers an hour slower so fine i'm just gonna push as hard as i can get fit as quick as i can and hopefully be able to start enjoying it again by you know feeling that progress so i didn't really have the expectation to perform as i as i'd left i let myself come back to it and just worked hard at it and didn't chase it. That's a really interesting way to think about it. I hadn't really thought about that. That's fascinating. Well, I mean, I've had lots of people say, oh, it's easy for you. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's harder for me because I have no, to yeah. again tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. Whereas you're going to take three days off and, you know, have a few beers in the evening or, you know, eat a bit more pudding or whatever because you've earned it. Whereas I, I can't do that. <laughs> I'm trying to stay yeah. in body fat and and there's a lot of other much, much better riders than me constantly up, turn up to the races. <laughs> yeah yeah and what, what what do you make of just the you know Matthew van der Poel just the, the fact that we're seeing cyclists not only at the pro level but the diversification of you know we talk about Lecole growing internationally but do you see the brand growing from a performance perspective into say I don't know gravel racing doing specific clothing for that or well, and what's your take on the diversification of of cycling uh one I think well I mean any diversification of cycling is fantastic anything that 
captures a new audience or engages the existing audience in a new way and you know makes them excited and passionate about it is great there's so much to enjoy about cycling you know listen i love cycling i love being part of the industry i love the participation of the activity myself so you know and i'm a, i'm as much of a fan of it as anyone you know i watch vanderpol you know doing the things that he does and remco vanderpol and i just think wow those i have so much respect for those guys and they are yeah. so supremely talented but they're also such hard workers like you need yeah. to. and you know it's a pleasure to understand what they're doing and appreciate how incredibly talented they are you know you watch some of those races and I, and I, I think it's actually easier for me to appreciate how talented they are because I have been in those races I've raced against Van der Poel I've raced against um, I haven't raced against Remco because he was he was still a junior while I was still racing but you know I, I know what it feels like and I know how hard the rest of that group is traveling for them to then go off the front is just phenomenal so that's yeah for for us as a brand and diversif- diversification into other parts we're really quite focused on core performance at the moment. So yep. I would associate more, even if there is gravel competition with adventure more than performance. So okay. I think we would probably hold back on that for a little bit longer. I think it's really important that we, we create a really consistent message and we don't try and spread ourselves too thin on the marketing front and on our messaging around what products we do, because with all honesty, the, the difference in the, in the product to become a gravel product from a road product is really small. You know, you might put pockets on the side of your shorts or something, but you know, the, it, there is not a huge difference in what you need, you know, in its, in its core elements. So no. then it becomes more of a marketing message and then you can only message so much. So we've got a long way to go on our performance message. We've got a long way to go on our performance credentials. You know, I'm still in the wind tunnel. Well, at the moment it's on lockdown and they're all shut but i will still be in the wind tunnel as much for the next 18 months as i have been for the last 18 months um, wow okay developing our, our kit and making sure it's as fast and as aerodynamic and you know there's still loads to go at for us on that so that's the focus yeah it's fascinating the whole aero thing with kit is fascinating and and so you've done a lot of research into sort of is it sticky air getting sticky air and and airflow and that's yeah. it's, it's it trip, finding materials yeah, that work the the term so creating micro turbulences through um uh ridges uh legal ridges which there's a legal depth to ridges on kit but you basically design fabrics with a weave that create these micro turbulences that create a boundary layer that then means the main airflow can flow over you or past the body uh, more efficiently and it's incredible i mean it's like magic really it's it's incredible the difference between some smooth non-tripping fabrics and then you start applying the tripping fabrics in the key areas it is an absolute game changer you know i almost feel frustrated that i didn't know as much as i do now about aerodynamics when i was racing because well while i was a pro i've never been to a wind tunnel and i think that's just an absolute failure for a start and since i've been to the wind tunnel about 12 times i'd say i've learned something new about aerodynamics every single time oh that's fascinating and has it changed the way you think on the bike or even your position yourself yeah not, not from a clothing perspective just just from your body yeah, i'm not i'm not training anywhere near as much as i used to be but i'm probably traveling at least as fast out training i mean really? I, I haven't got races to taper for so i you know i've got nothing to peak for but my cycling is more aerodynamic now than it's ever been including any time in my career which is a bit of a waste for while it was my job that's not <laughs> great. but still it looks good on Strava it does yeah well I've got a lot of mates on Strava and there's quite what's funny is in this lockdown period we've been lo- doing lots of solo rides and yeah. the entertainment I get from you know taking KOMs or friends of mine or you know doing something where everyone can see and we chat about it or we all go for something you know all that kind of stuff is, is really good fun and it's really kept me entertained and gave me something to focus on during a time where we couldn't ride as a group and you can't do your standard club rides Oh, that community pit has been a, a lifesaver, I think, for a lot of cyclists around the world during during lockdown period. It's uh, great to have that camaraderie, camaraderie and, and common ground as well. I think it's super important, yeah. which is awesome. Look, I, I appreciate you are super busy. So thank you very much for, for taking the time to join us today. Just for everyone listening, I think that um, I hope we really emphasize just how unique the call is as, as is as a business. Do have a look at the show notes and 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 check out the links and and support support the business growth further and if there's any questions i'm sure there's a uh, all the information on the website and so that people can read up or reach out to to people yeah and i would just say last thing is you know enjoy your cycling stay safe 
you know that's what it's all about yeah excellent anything else you want to add no thanks for thanks for the time it's been a pleasure to chat Look, good i think we cover a lot of good stuff <laughs> yeah good man excellent awesome well thanks for your time good luck with the childcare. Yeah. stay in touch and um we look forward to seeing the the business continue to grow from strength to strength excellent thank you take care Cheers, mate. Bye. thanks bye. bye thanks for listening please subscribe to the podcast and more importantly don't forget to download the unfound app and join cyclists from around the world on the hub we'll see you on there